Lots of Americans say we need to replace the Electoral College with a national popular vote to save democracy. Could this seriously backfire? Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. Did you know YouTube has been secretly unsubscribing people from America Uncovered? This channel would be so much bigger if it wasn't being shadow banned by YouTube. So, do me a favor and if you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. My goal is to get to 600,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And now, on with the show. I love democracy. But elections couldn't be more of a contentious issue in the US these days, especially as the 2024 presidential elections ramp up. Because of that, people are talking about the Electoral College, a massively important part of US elections that determines who becomes president every four years. A quick refresher for those who forgot, Americans don't use direct popular vote to determine the next US president. Each state gets to vote. While people do vote for their least unfavored candidate on election day, what they're actually doing is telling their state's electors who to vote for. There are 538 electors across the country, and the candidate who gets the most of those becomes president. Each state is given one elector for each member of the House of Representatives and Senate it has. The number of representatives are based on population size, while the number of senators is fixed at two for each state. Electors are usually nominated and voted on at state party conventions. In most states, the electoral system works on a winner-take-all basis. This means the party that receives the majority of the popular vote gets all the electoral votes. For example, if 51% of people in California vote for Harris, then the Democratic Party's electors get all of California's 54 electoral votes. None go to Republicans, which is why Republicans in California are always so mad. It turns out lots of Americans aren't big fans of the Electoral College. In fact, almost two-thirds of Americans prefer a popular vote. After all, that's how we select American idols. And is the presidency really any different? Young Democrats especially prefer a popular vote. And even Republicans are divided on the issue. Not surprising, since in this century, Democrats won the popular vote, but lost the presidency due to the electoral college system not once, but twice. The 2000 election between George Bush and Al Gore, and the 2016 election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. They literally won a popularity contest, but were still considered losers. Kind of like being voted the winner in a Paul Giamatti lookalike contest. And of course, Trump's presidential election especially made people deranged which is why many are now in favor of abolishing the Electoral College. But killing the Electoral College would require an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, since the system is enshrined in it. Amending that isn't realistic unless you can get political consensus. <laughs> but this is America. So that hasn't stopped people from criticizing it. The Washington Post says the Electoral College whatever virtues it may have had for the Founding Fathers, is no longer tenable for American democracy. The New York Times says the Electoral College, which is written into the Constitution, is more than just a vestige of the founding era, it is a living symbol of America's original sin. Sorry, Internet, you were wrong. It turns out the New York Times is Catholic. So, broadly speaking, there are a couple of arguments critics of the Electoral College make. One is that it's racist, established by the Founding Fathers to protect Southern slave states as part of a compromise. You see, since electors are determined by representatives, and representatives are determined by population, southern states with slaves would have more power because of their larger population. The northern states didn't want slaves to count at all, since they weren't being treated as human beings anyway. But in this one very particular case, the slave owners wanted them to be their equals. Weird. So they came up with the three-fifths compromise, where one slave counted as three-fifths of the person. Which was not really an advantage for the slave states compared to free states. One American historian even points out that the slave population didn't really give southern states a particular advantage until after northern states abolished slavery and they counted as full people. And that was decades after the Electoral College was formed. Nonetheless, people like AOC, claim that the Electoral College is a shadow of slavery's power on America today. But if the Electoral College truly is pro-slavery, 
It's done an awful job. It brought into power John Quincy Adams, an anti-slavery hero, and Abraham Lincoln, the president who ended slavery. Neither of them probably would have been elected in office had there been a direct popular vote. Anyway, the everything is racist argument is running out of steam these days. So the other argument against the Electoral College is that it undermines democracy by allowing a president to be in office without earning the popular vote. The progressive Brennan Center for Justice calls the Electoral College one of the most fundamentally undemocratic parts of U.S. elections, one that enables a tyranny of the minority. And here I thought progressives were all about minorities. The issue is that the Electoral College, by design, gives people in small states like Wyoming and North Dakota a lot more power than, say, a direct popular voting system would. Voters in Wyoming, for example, have nearly four times as much influence as California voters do, since the number of residents each elector represents is much lower there. If it were up to a popular vote, California would have way more influence than Wyoming. That's why the Washington Post editorial board says it's time to let the majority rule. But the Founding Fathers were well aware that majorities left unchecked can threaten minorities by accumulating too much power. That's why they designed not just the Electoral College, but the entire U.S. government to function in a way that balances what the majority wants with protections for state governments and minority interests. One proof? Look no further than the U.S. Senate, which gives every state two senators regardless of population. Heck, even the way bills get passed reflects America's protections for minorities from majorities through things like congressional committees, filibusters, and judicial reviews. Critics dismiss talk of majority tyranny as just an excuse to get in the way of the people's will. But think about this. The Electoral College actually forces whoever wants to be president to appeal to a diversity of voters nationwide. And it's more than just racial diversity. It protects citizens in small states from being crushed by big states. Do you really want California to determine the future of the country? For a country as large and diverse as the U.S., there are all sorts of political, economic, and ideological interests. What people in the cities want and need aren't always the same as rural farmers or factory workers. The U.S. system isn't meant to just reward politicians with the largest number of voters alone. It intentionally rewards those who can manage to bring together the most different types of voters across a broad geographic constituency. Both Al Gore and Hillary Clinton seem to have ignored this and lost as a result. You can see Al Gore's electoral votes were less dispersed, which means less diverse than Bush's. The same for Hillary Clinton's against Trump's. They focused on appealing to a very narrow demographic as opposed to a wide variety of voters. Personally, I'm shocked saying she keeps hot sauce in her purse wasn't enough to win Hillary Clinton, Wisconsin. If the Electoral College was eliminated, candidates would be rewarded for focusing solely on the biggest cities while neglecting voters everywhere else. And given how high populated places like New York City and San Francisco have voted for policies that they're now regretting, I'm not sure the rest of the nation is interested in giving them even more influence to determine who should be president. Obviously, talking about elections on YouTube is very controversial. That's why so many people are getting secretly unsubscribed. Again, if you like the show, subscribe. And if you're already subscribed, make sure you're still subscribed. You can also support the show on Patreon by clicking that orange button. And here's another one of my videos I want to show you that I think you'll really like and probably won't be notified about by YouTube. Just give it a click. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.